trust that the word this morning will be a blessing to each one of you because it's not my word but God's word. Uh, we are going to be taking a small break, a brief hiatus starting this Sunday from our regular systematic study in the book of Romans. And we'll resume our study in the book of Romans after we celebrate Resurrection Sunday which falls on April 9th. We'll come back to it but a little bit later. As I mentioned earlier, Wednesday 8th, just a couple of days ago, the world recognized and celebrated Women's Day. And so I thought it would be apt to preach on one of the women of the Bible, one of the women of God. And I, and I prayed about it and I believe uh, God put on my heart, laid on my heart to preach to you about a very special woman of God called Rahab. And her story is found in Joshua chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles today, you can turn to the book of Joshua chapter 2. Just in case you didn't bring your Bibles, the verses will be displayed on the screen behind me. So we're going to be in Joshua chapter 2. And I'm going to share her story, talk about her life, and show it to you in about snick, uh, six snapshots. Six snapshots. So the first point is Rahab's reputation. That's verses 1. And then followed by Rahab's ruse. Followed by Rahab's reason. Number 4, Rahab's request. Rahab's rescue. And then finally, Rahab's recognition. So we'll begin with Rahab's reputation. And I'm going to read to you from the book of Joshua chapter 2. Just the first verse for now. Joshua 2 1 says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, that's the Hebrew pronunciation of the <laughs> word Nun, because if you say son of Nun, it causes a little bit of confusion, <laughs> right? Son of nobody, or depending on your religious background, if you've come out of Catholicism, then how can Nun have a child? So Joshua, the son of Nun, we'll stick to the Hebrew pronunciation, sent. Two men secretly from Shaitim, or maybe your Bible says Acacia Grove. Acacia Grove is English, Shaitim is Hebrew, as spies. Saying, so he said, he selected two men, two choice men, and he said, Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to go and view the land, especially Jericho. Why two men? Years earlier, about 38 to 40 years earlier, Moses sent out 12 spies to go and view the land. 10 came back with a very negative report and that bad news spread throughout the Israelite camp like wildfire. They said we won't be able to conquer the land. There are giants living over there. Only two came back with a positive report. They were optimistic and the two were Joshua and Caleb, the same Joshua that's mentioned over here. So now Joshua has learned his lesson and he says, I just need a few good men. Or to use an English proverb, too many cooks spoil the broth. Or to quote another verse, Deuteronomy 19.15 says, By the mouth of two witnesses, the matter will be established. And so he sends out two men to go and find out information about the land. Why Jericho? Because if you're standing by the Jordan River, that's the first city that is immediately in your view, in your sight. You can immediately see the city of Jericho. But that's not the only reason. Jericho happens to be a very strategic city to capture because all the major trade routes pass through Jericho. But there's one more reason and that's the divine reason God had somebody on mind that he wanted to reach in Jericho and that lady is Rahab and so he wants his people to go and rescue Rahab, go and deliver Rahab. So let's read on in verses 1 it says, so they were, they were told to go and view the land especially Jericho and they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. So I've noticed that many commentators try and sanitize the image of Rahab. They try and sanitize Rahab. They try and say the, the Hebrew word for prostitute is the word zana, and so it could also mean innkeeper. And that's true, Rahab was also 
an innkeeper, but it becomes abundantly clear that she was also a prostitute or was <coughs> moonlighting as a prostitute. She might have been an innkeeper by day, but by night she was also a harlot. Because when you get to the New Testament, and she's mentioned three times over there, twice in, once in the book of James and once in the book of Hebrews, she's referred to as Rahab the prostitute, and the Greek word for prostitute is the word porni, which we get our English word pornography from. So in that context, it always means prostitute. And, uh, and I just want to read to you this morning something that Herbert Lockyer said. He's a minister who wrote over 50 books. So here's what he has to say. He says, both Jewish and Christian writers have tried to prove that Rahab was a different woman from the one that the Bible always speaks of as a harlot. To them, it's abhorrent that such a disreputable person could be included in the Lord's genealogy. But let me tell you about my God. My God is able to take the most notorious criminal, an absolute wretch, a drug addict, a porn addict, an alcoholic, even a religious hypocrite, and turn their life around and make it something beautiful. My dear brother, my dear sister in Christ, even if you feel like you have drifted really, really far away, I want to remind you this morning that you cannot out -sin the grace of God. You cannot bring yourself to a point where you're disqualified to receive his radical, powerful, embracing love. If God came for Rahab, he will come for you and he will come for you because his love is unmatched and unparalleled. As we sang earlier, he is mighty to save. I, rem I remember hearing this beautiful story of a little girl who had a collection of dolls. And let me tell you, it was an impressive collection of dolls. And every morning as she woke up, she would make her bed. That in and of itself is impressive. And after making her bed, she would line up all her dolls in order. And it was very pleasant to the eye. She arranged it very neatly. One day a visitor came to her house and looked at all her collection of dolls and asked her, which amongst all these dolls is your personal favorite? Without missing a beat, she walked over to the closet and she brought this really shabby looking doll. And the visitor looked at her and said, why this doll? I mean, most of its hair is missing. Its clothes are tattered. Its head is dangling by one little sliver of plastic. One shoe is missing. You know, it looks so shabby. It looks so messy. Why do you choose this little doll, this shabby looking doll? And the girl said to him, because if I don't love this doll, Nobody will. Because if I don't love this doll, nobody will. I believe that that story accurately portrays, accurately displays God's love for each one of us. He uses the foolish things to shame the wise. He uses the weak things to confound the strong. He chooses the lowly things, the despised things, the things that are not to nullify the things that are. That's the kind of God that you and me worship. And here we're looking at a story of a lady who went from being a prostitute to a princess, who went from being a harlot to a heroine, who went from being a lady who walked in the night to a lady who walked in the light. She went from Amen. going, she went from the house of shame into God's hall of fame. Amen. And that is the story of Rahab. That is her reputation, but God is able to heal us from our past. Let's go on to the second point, which is Rahab's ruse. Can I request somebody to read for me verses 2 to 7 from your Bibles from the book of Joshua chapter? Anybody with a loud voice, read verses 2 to 7. The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, Yes, the men came to me. But I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. 
So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone up, the gate was shut. Thank you. So as you read these verses, I have a question for you. Do you think Rahab lied? Do you think Rahab told a lie? A straightforward reading of this text, what do you think? Yes. I think the answer is pretty obvious. She did tell a big fat lie, right? But that's not the tricky question. Here's another question. Do you think God approved of Rahab's lie? That's the question that people have been debating over the centuries. Do you think God approved of a lie? Many people will say, yes, in this particular situation, God approved of her lie. And, and the reasoning that they often use is she chose the lesser sin. When, when two sins were on the table, she chose the lesser sin. And um, to, to illustrate, I'll share with you this uh, story that I heard about D.L. Mooney and Charles Spurgeon. So D.L. Mooney, the world famous evangelist, wanted to go and meet his role model, his hero in the faith, Charles Spurgeon, the biblical expositor who had this huge church in London, very very famous, very reputed preacher. So Moody made his way to London and knocked on the door of Spurgeon. And Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon opened the door, but Moody was flabbergasted because Spurgeon had a cigar in his mouth. And Moody said to him, how can you, a man of God, smoke a cigar? To which Spurgeon, without missing a beat, placed his hand on Moody's protruding belly, his massive belly, and said, just like you, a man of God can be so fat. So both of them were pointing fingers at each other. Both of them were convicting each other of sin, right? But if I ask you, what do you think was the more acceptable sin in that, even if that sto story was true, and I don't think it's true, <laughs> what was the more acceptable sin? I think most of us will agree. I think it's safe to assume and most of us will say for a man of God to be a chain smoker, that, that doesn't look good on him. I don't think God would approve that. But if you eat food, you know, every now and then you have a second serve, third serve, you're a little bit brown, a little bit plump, a little bit chubby. That's okay, right? After all, food is God's gift to us. So there is an acceptable sin and there is a sin that's looked down upon. That's the reasoning that people use when it comes to Rahab's lie. They say she only lied, but she lied to protect and save the lives of the two Israelite spies and so she that, that was a noble deed it was a necessary life she there was no other way that she could go about it somehow I'm not convinced with that theory and, and in Christian ethics it's called graded absolutism and one of its primary proponents is a man by the name of Norman Geisler who is no more he's with the Lord brilliant man basically graded absolutism is saying one law is heavier than a another when they're pitted against each other. There are some laws that are heavier or more important than others when they both contrast it. Somehow I don't agree with it. And the reason that I don't agree with it is because when you look at scripture and what scripture has to say about lies, it's the, the testimony is abundant and it's clear. For instance, I mean, just yesterday I was going through so many verses on lies. I read about 20 verses just to quote a couple of them. Psalms chapter 5 verse 6, God says he destroys all those who tell lies. Revelation 21 8 says that liars will have their part or their portion in the lake of fire. If you look at Proverbs chapter 12 verse 22, it says that lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. So it becomes abundantly clear that the God who is truth, I mean he is truth, Jesus said in John 14 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. So if God is truth, he is diametrically opposed to anything that is deceitful. He is diametrically opposed to falsehood. And so I don't think it's very wise to use Rahab when she just started believing in God. A Canaanite woman who was steeped in Canaanite culture, let me tell you, Canaanite culture was absolutely depraved. Okay, They did witchcraft. Uh, they worshipped all these uh, pagan deities, so they were steeped in idolatry, they, had, they offered child sacrifices, they were involved in bestiality, so many different sins, they were depraved people. So you can't take Rahab, the harlot at that time, as an example or a model of Christian ethics and say, say she lied over there and therefore it's okay for us as Christians today to tell white lies whenever necessary. 
And also, I think, based on the character of God, I don't think that it's very wise to conclude that lies are permissible during some situations. Even if you think about Jesus himself, who came as a man, he never was stuck in this sort of a moral dilemma where he had to choose and, and you know, maybe lie in order to avoid hurting the feelings of somebody. Hebrews 4.15 says, we have a great high priest who has never said He was tempted at all points. Which means he shouldn't have been tempted in something like this. If, if he was tempted at all points, yet remained without sin, then he I don't think he ever told a lie. Jesus never told a lie. And even as Brother Bergis prophetically prayed that God is not a man that he should lie. And we know that Jesus was God in the flesh. And so even taking the example of Jesus, I'm not convinced about graded absolutism or telling lies in certain in certain situations, certain crux situations when you don't have any other option. But there's another reason. Even if I'm wrong this morning, I would rather err on this side of presenting God as a God of truth who is always consistently opposed to lies than say that once in a while God accepts lies and then be wrong that side. I would rather be wrong on this side. And I understand that not everything is a lie. Okay, so for instance, supposing I'm going out of station and I leave the lights on in my house, that, that, that's not a lie in case a thief comes by. That's more of, that's subject to interpretation, what I was trying to accomplish. That's not, I'm not lying to the thief that I'm there <laughs> in the house. Right? So those kind of things are gray areas that a lie is only something that is deliberately <laughs> done, spoken in verbal form or written form, that has this intention of deliberately deceiving somebody else. And somebody might ask, but what about, what about, and these are those hard situations, I, I admit it's hard. What about if one day a terrorist comes to your house, and let's say I have children during that time when he comes, and he says, do you have any children? And I see maybe he's AK-47, and I see in his eyes that he's ready to kill, he's ready to take lives, he's ready to finish somebody off, or he has some knife, and looks very threatening, and he says, do you have any children? And the truth is, in my house I do have two children. I don't have to answer, and I understand that this is bending the truth, but I don't have to answer his question saying, yes, I have two children. I can say, no, I don't have any children because the real question he's asking is, he's not completing it, but the real question that he's asking is, do you have any children that I can kill? And the answer to that question is, no, I don't have any children that you can kill. But he's not coming there for a survey, you know, he's saying, do you have any children? I'll make a note of it. So he has a different, he has a sinister motive, and to that I can answer no. So if you're wondering about those kind of situations, a little bit of a crash course in Christian ethics. But the point is this, that I believe that Rahab, even though she lied, she was a woman who, she was a work in progress. She, just, she had just begun a sanctification process. And so we shouldn't use her as a role model to say that sex lies are acceptable in certain situations. So let's go on to the third thing, which is Rahab's reason. If somebody could read for me verses 8 to 11. Rahab's reason, verses 8 to 11, three verses. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you and when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sihon and Og whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Thank you. So, I am calling this point Rahab's reason, because this is the reason why she did everything she did before. She took the men, she hit them, but she deceived the king's men, or when the word came to her, you know, bring out the men who came to you. She said, no, they were here. It's true, they were here, but they went out of the city gates before dark. So go and pursue them quickly, she adds. Otherwise, you know, you may not be able to catch up with them. So why did she do that so many times? We spend too much of time on Rahab's ruse. Everybody is debating whether it is 
you can legitimately tell a lie and still be okay with God and we spend too much time working that out but here's what the author really wants us to focus on it's Rahab's reason which is verses 8 to 11 she begins she, before the men lay down so they were hidden by the stalks of flax which had been used to make linen and rope and so she hit, she hit them very successfully before they went to sleep she comes up to them on the roof and said to them verse 9 she said, she said to the men, I hope. Does it say I hope? I know. She says, I know. Does she say, I think? Does she say, maybe, I wish? No, she says, I know. There's a ring of certainty to that. She says, I know that the Lord, and if you see the word Lord in your Bibles, it's capitalized, which, which refers to the fact that she's referring to yeah. the Jewish God, the covenant God, Yahweh, not just Elohim, which is God generically, right? She's referring to their covenant God, the God of the Israelites. And she says, I know, I know for a fact, that the Lord has given you the land. I, I recently heard a, a little clip of Mr. Bean. He was describing this one time. Uh, he was describing this one time where some people came up to him. He was buying some car parts or something near his store. And some people came to him. And this one man said to him, looked at him and said, she was, first he was staring at him, you know, trying to figure out. And then he looks at him and says, I tell you, you are a spitting image of Mr. Bean. And Mr. Bean said, I am the actor. I am Rowan Atkinson. I am I'm the guy who plays. He said, yeah, you wish you were him. You're his local guy. No, you're not really him. You look like him. You look like you can be part of his family. You look like his double. And the more that Mr. Bean, Rowan Atkinson, tried to convince him, the more he didn't believe him. The reason I, I share the story with you is because so many of us have evidence. We've had real encounters with the Lord. You know, we've seen him for who he is. We've experienced his glory, his providence. And yet many of us walk away in unbelief. You know, we don't believe that he's really capable of what he promises. And so Rahab over here says, I know that he's given you the, the land. The Lord has given you the land. The second thing that stands out to me, and there are three, that was the first. The second thing is what she says in verse 10. In verses 10, she says, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and all whom you devoted to destruction. Now notice that this happened about 38 to 40 years ago. Leah probably wasn't even born at that. And, and she was not there when God parted the Red Sea. She was not there to witness it. Many of the Jews were there, and yet they didn't believe. And here's a woman who's saying, we have heard, faith comes by hearing. They have heard over and over again the story of how God parted the Red Seas and gave them so much of military victory. And so my point is this. Supposing, supposing just, just imagine with me. Supposing God suddenly levitated me over here and I was just floating in the air this Sunday, all of you would be shocked, maybe some of you would pull out your cell phones, take a video that will eventually become viral and let me tell you, next Sunday this place will be packed, the roads and all will be filled because people will come to see me floating in the air. But supposing it doesn't happen next Sunday, the attendance will drop and then they might give me a second chance coming back the following week. But after that, if I don't, you know, float in midair, the attendance will drop back to you faithful people. So, <laughs> my point is this. Many people are seeking signs and wonders. And it's not necessarily wrong to expect a miracle from God. But even Jesus looked down upon people because he said the only sign you receive is a sign of Noah, right? Because they always were asking him, show us a miracle, show us a sign. The Pharisees and the tax collectors. And so my point is this, the words of Jesus, blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. Rahab was somebody who, was, who had not seen all the miracles, all the mighty miracles, and yet she put her faith in the God of Israel. And then the third thing that I want to share with you that I believe stands out in this section of scripture, what we're calling Rahab's reason, is if you look at verses 11, she says, and as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you for the Lord your God he is still God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath 
So, if you remember, actually if you have your Bible, then if you want to turn with me, you can go with me to the book of Numbers briefly. I want to show you something in the book of Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. If you go down um, to verses 26. Yeah. Verses 26. So the background is Moses sends out the 12 spies. Now they're back. They've come back to Moses and here's their report that they're going to give Moses about what they saw, about all they spying. Verses 26, And they came to Moses and Aaron and, and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, We came to the land to which you sent us. It does flow with milk and honey and, and this is its fruit. However, However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak here. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and all along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land, land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And they saw the Nephilim. So the point is this, that so often we think the enemy is bigger than he actually is because we know that you know our, our fight is not against flesh and blood but against power and principality. So yes, they were. This is a uh, the book of Joshua is all about military conquest and all that. But today, so often we get overwhelmed thinking the enemy is beating us or you know he's troubling us so much that we we, we become just despondent. We give up hope. But the truth is. This is the principle that I want to share with you. The complexity of the problem should be measured by the competency of the person solving it. I'll repeat that, I'll say that again. The complexity of the problem should be measured by the competency of the person solving it. In other words, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is fighting our battles and He's got our back, we have nothing to worry about because the enemy is nobody in front of God. Doesn't matter how many people he is deceived. Doesn't matter if he's a roaring lion. He's a lion on a leash. Amen. And so in front of God, he's nobody. And if we have God fighting for us and God on us or our side, we have nothing to worry about. I remember the story that I told some time ago in the Bible study about this famous magician called Harry Houdini. And his act was always escaping anything that he was put in. So if you handcuff him, he can break the handcuffs. You put him in a jail cell, you'll be able to break out of them. One time he was in Scotland, one of the most secure prison facilities over there. And his 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 act was to for, for them to handcuff him. They put him in a straitjacket and they locked up one of these very secure prison cells. And he was going to free himself, he was going to liberate himself. And so he began his act. He got out of the handcuffs, which was chained to a bench. He got out of the straitjacket, but then he was not able to open the cell door. And he was trying for about one hour now, you know, sweat was pouring down. He's becoming really nervous. And finally, in exhaustion, he just sat down. He gave up. But by mistake, he leaned against the jail door, which just swung open because it was open all along. The point is this, that so often we, we fail to realize what a powerful God we serve. He's fighting for us and we are on the winning side. We will be on the victorious side because of our God, because of his power and his capability. And so we ought to remember from this, the principle is that the enemy is not as strong as they seem. Let's go on to the next thing, which is Rahab's request. Rahab's request. Can somebody read for me Joshua 2 verses 12 to 13. She has a request here. After her confession of faith, after the reason for her risk, after hiding those men, she has a request now. Let's look at her request in verses 12 and 13. Can somebody read for me, please? Now Jehovah pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, you will show kindness to your father's house, 
to give me fruit of it. And they to save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all they have and deliver our life from them. Thank you, thank you, brother. So what we realize from these verses is that Rahab is not content with being saved on her own. She's not being uh, selfish. She's not only worried about herself. So, okay, good, deliverance is coming for me. I'm going to be safe when the judgment and the destruction of God comes. She's also concerned about her brothers, her sisters, her mother, her father. And so salvation is so precious that Rahab is not content in going to heaven alone. She wants everybody that she can get, the people that matter to her. And I think we can learn a lesson from this. This is why in the book of James chapter 2 verses 25, James holds up Rahab as a paragon of faith, as, a, as an exemplar of faith. As a, somebody whose works justified their faith. Not just their faith, but their works justified their faith. Because she was going around, she was saying, when you come, can you also ensure that my family is safe? She's so interested. She's so concerned. I came across this interesting poem that I heard. I want to read it out for you this morning. It's about, it's about doing works. It's about serving the Lord uh, as evidence of our salvation. To show that it's legitimate and genuine. Here's the poem. He was, it's talking about a man, right? He wasn't much for stirring about. That wasn't his desire. While others worked to serve the Lord, he was just sitting by the fire. Same old story day by day, he never seemed to tire. While others faithfully served the Lord, he was sitting by the fire. One day he died, as all must do. Some say he went up higher, but if he's doing what he always did, he's still sitting by the fire. And you know what fire we're talking about. <laughs> so salvation should be demonstrated. It should be evident in somebody's life where they should go out and they should reach, they should reach others with the gospel, with the good news, and help in whatever way they can. And so maybe a challenge could be even this Easter, Easter is fast approaching, Resurrection Sunday is fast approaching, maybe we can begin to pray about and think about some somebody that we want to invite, somebody who doesn't know the gospel, somebody maybe who's toying with the idea or somebody who has been wrestling the idea, maybe we can call them and come this Easter to come uh, and uh, experience our worship service. So uh, that is the challenge. We'll go to the next point which is Rahab's rescue point number five. If somebody could Read for me verses 14 and then go down to 18 and 19. So if somebody could read for me under Rahab's rescue, her deliverance, verses 14, then go down to 18 and 19. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. Unless... When we enter the land, you have tied the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house, if anyone goes out, outside your house into the street, his blood will be on his own head. We will not be responsible. As for anyone who is in the house with you, his blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on him. Thank you. So, I don't know, as you read these verses, doesn't it remind you of something? What do you think it reminds you of? The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is one, but one particular instant where the blood of Jesus was used, or not the blood of Jesus. Moses. Passover. Yeah, the Passover. So, this reminds us, this is what they know. It, it goes back, it harkens back to the Passover, and they're telling her to do something very similar. She doesn't have a lamp to put the blood on the doorposts and lintels. So they tell her to tie a scarlet rope, which signifies the blood of Jesus, which points forward to the blood of Jesus that will ultimately be shed on Calvary. And they say, when you tie that scarlet rope, we will pass over. The judgment of God will pass over this house and everybody who's in this house. So they say, if anybody is outside, then his blood is not on our hands. And it reminds you of the Passover when the angel of death or literally the destroyer passed through and uh, killed all the firstborn of the Egyptians, but spared all the Israelites. The, the angel of death I saw somewhere did not look to see who was inside the house, only looked to see the blood. When wherever there was blood, the angel of death passed over. And it's similar over here. That's what they're asking her to do. Jesus 
is our Passover lamb, and we're going to celebrate that in a few weeks. We ought to celebrate that every day, but it's nice to have a time of the year where we can remember that and celebrate that he's our Passover lamb during Good Friday and Easter. So nature forms us. Sin deforms us. Schools can inform us. A jail may even reform us. The world tries to conform us, but it's only Jesus who can and will transform us. And we are transformed by his blood. It's, it's his blood that gives us a covering. It's his blood that transforms us and changes us for the better. And so we must be washed in his precious blood. Let's end with the last point for this morning, which is Rahab's recognition. Rahab's recognition. Can somebody read for me Matthew chapter 1, verses 5? And then somebody else read for me Hebrews 11, 31. So if somebody could turn to Matthew chapter 1, verses 5, and then somebody read for me Hebrews 11, 31. And Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse. Thank you. Hebrews 11, 31, if somebody else has. Thank you. So, this is Rahab's recognition. She started off by being a prostitute, but then she ends up in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus. She marries this guy by, called Salmon, not the fish. She marries this guy <laughs> called Salmon, who Jewish tradition, not the Bible, but Jewish tradition, according to the Jewish Targums, it says that he was one of the spies who went to spy the land. And it's possible, it's an interesting theory. Might be possible, possibly. <laughs> so, Salmon marries... Rahab, and they have a son. What's his son's name? What's the son's name? Boaz. Boaz. And Boaz later marries Ruth. Ruth, and they have a son called Obed, and then Obed has a son called Jesse, and then Jesse, one of Jesse's sons, is none other than the greatest king of Israel, King David. So Rahab went from being a prostitute to a princess because she was part of the royal line part of the royal lineage and eventually who is born in the line of David? Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Messiah who is the ultimate king, right? So Rahab's reputation was cleaned up and God really, really healed her from her past, whatever mistakes that she had made and he, he, she was part of the Lord's genealogy. Again, Hebrews 11.31, I'm encouraged to find Rahab in the hall of faith. That's what many theologians call it, the hall of faith. There are so many people mentioned over there like Noah and Enoch and Abel and Abraham and Moses. But the, the, the writer of the Hebrews says he doesn't even have time to mention certain people like Barak and Gideon. And so others, even King David, his name is mentioned, but he says, I don't have time to talk about David and Samuel, the great prophet. But Rahab made it into the hall of faith. And in her faith was exemplary. And that's why she is there, because she welcomed the spies with peace. I don't know what you want to be recognized for, even at the end of your life. What do you want people to talk about you? What do you want them to say about you? How, how do you want to be Recognized. I remember when I was a bit younger, I always wanted the label of being a fiery preacher. And after some time, that changed a little bit. I remember this one time when I was invited to speak at a church in Delhi, and some of you know this story. So it was one of my father's friend's churches. It was a Hindi church, so there was translation. So I was, and it was a charismatic church. So I thought, let me give it to them in their style. So I thought I'd preach a very fiery sermon. And the translator also matched me in every sentence, you know, with the same oomph and um, all the expressions that I was using. And I was very, very, I was, uh, I was all animated and everything. And towards the end, as I was building up to the climax, they even had music to accompany my <laughs> preaching. I didn't know that was coming from somewhere. Music started giving back into my preaching and it sounded all the more, you know, emotional and all the more touching. And I really enjoyed myself. I lost my voice after preaching that day. <laughs> I really enjoyed myself. But now, those kind of labels don't matter so much to me. I don't know if you consider me to be a fiery preacher. Maybe say most of the time you're on sin sometimes. <laughs> I blame and those kind of things. But those kind of things don't matter to me so much. I want to be a man who preaches Christ and Him crucified. Preaches 
the unadulterated gospel. So I'm asking you this morning, dear brother, dear sister, what do you want to be known for in this life? What, do, what is the legacy that you're going to leave? Rahab was somebody who went from being a prostitute to a princess, from the house of shame to God's hall of fame. Only God can change our stories and make our mess into a message. And all our tests into a testimony as somebody wonderfully said. Shall we look to the Lord in prayer? Loving, gracious Father, we thank you for the story of, the story of Rahab. She's such a powerful woman. What amazing faith she had, Lord, just hearing about the things that you had done amongst your people. So many of your own people at that time, Lord Jesus, who witnessed the miracles, chose to walk away in unbelief, Lord Jesus. But Rahab, just listening to it, decided to put her faith in you, her trust in you. And we see, Lord Jesus, even as uh, she would have grown in a sanctification, Lord Jesus, ends up in your genealogy, Lord. We thank you, Father God, that uh, you give us these examples of people's lives that are radically transformed, Lord Jesus, which gives us great hope, Lord Jesus. No matter what our past entail, no matter the mistakes that we made that caused us shame or maybe somebody else made mistakes and that brought us shame or brought our family shame. Yet you're the God who's able to wipe all that out and give us a fresh clean start uh, no matter how many times we fail. We thank you that you're a God who loves us no matter what we did. But you love us too much to leave us like that, Lord. So when we come back to you, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would cleanse us, that you would uh, treat our wounds, Lord Jesus, and that you would heal us completely, and that we would live for your glory, Lord Jesus. I pray, Father God, for anybody who has some traumatic incident that occurred to them and has taken a toll on them, Father, I pray because of your healing power that they would experience your sanctifying grace today, Lord Jesus. I pray that you bring them the healing that only your blood can bring, Father God. We worship and praise you, Lord Jesus. Bless the fellowship that follows. We commit this afternoon and evening into your hands. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen.